Hello, everyone. Welcome back. I am Christine Dixon of The Ordinary Sacred. And this is the second video in my series called No Pathologies in IFS, Internal Family Systems. The first video was about bipolar disorder, or what is sometimes called manic depression, and looking at it from the lens of parts, the different parts that are involved in that diagnosis. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the diagnosis of obsessive compulsive disorder um, and what the cluster of parts around that might look like. Uh, and you'll see that it just all makes sense. Um, this was a part of a series that I did with my uh, monthly IFS practitioner group. Um, we have topics, I do some teaching, we discuss it. We have a Q&A, case study presentation. Um, sometimes I'll do demos with people where they work on their own parts that get activated by clients. Um, if you are an IFS practitioner or therapist and you're interested in joining a group like that, um, you're welcome to go to my website, theordinarysacred.com, and you will see some more information about it. We meet uh, the second Friday of every month, generally. So we are meeting this Friday if you want to uh, join before that and, and join us live on Friday. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen uh, for this. There's just one slide that I want to share on obsessive compulsive disorder. And I have this, you know, <laughs> cliche picture here of a lot of people when they think of obsessive compulsive disorder, think of someone continually washing their hands. Um, but I'm gonna show you just some of the, the common parts that are likely in, involved in this diagnosis. So first, there's often a part who obsesses about something. For example, something being contaminated or a possible illness. Um, and this is usually based on a negative past experience. And this can really run the gamut of all kinds of things. Um, it could be a fear of a driving far from our home, or it could be, it usually involves some kind of fear, but it can also be an intrusive thought um, that's disturbing to us, like a thought of harm to ourselves, harm to another person. Again, it's really, it can be difficult to get out of the mindset of pathology, right? And of this diagnosis. But when you think of it as parts, you understand um, that there's a part that is doing this for a reason. And when you get curious about it and you go in and you ask the part who is perhaps producing some kind of intrusive thought, what it's afraid would happen if it didn't do this you will find out its reason, right? So it might be based in a, a past experience. For example, I have a part that um, is very <laughs> diligent and thorough in checking every lock before I go to bed and it'll second guess, you know, I'll get in bed, did I check the locks? I've got to go back and check them again. Um, and when I talk to the part, you know, what are you afraid would happen? It brought me back to an experience when I was living in Turkey. And I guess one night forgot to lock the front door and some people came in and ransacked our house and took a bunch of electronics and different things. Um, but the terrifying thing to my system was the fact that my infant baby was in his room in his crib and the thought of strangers being in the house and potentially harming him was really significant to my system. And so from that day on, this part took on the job of obsessively checking the locks before I go, go to bed. Um, so I was able to turn toward it and thank it and say, oh man, I really appreciate you and what you're trying to do and, you know, maybe update it. It's, it's in a much lesser form now. It doesn't have as much um, angst or obsessiveness around it. I still will, you know, have the routine of checking the doors before bed. But, um, but it's not as burdened. And, but there can also be, for example, if you go to a part who obsessively produces um, you know, these intrusive thoughts about harming other people or harming yourself or something like that, or just disturbing images, 
you you can go in and ask and they might say, you know, if I didn't do this, you would have to focus on this other trauma or you'd have to feel these really difficult emotions. So it can act as a distraction in some way, or it might say, I'm trying to punish you. Um, it might be a guilt tripper part or something like that, right? So there's all kinds of reasons why a, a compulsive part or an obsessive part might do, um, cause this obsession. Uh, so you just need to go in and ask it and it will tell you. If you can unblend from the parts who fear and judge it, which we'll look at. But again, the, the counterpart to the obsessive uh, part is a part who, in order to lower the anxiety of the obsessive part, activates a compulsion of choice. Um, so that would be washing hands, performing checking and rituals. So I guess the part that's checking the locks was actually, in my case, the, the compulsion, right? I have to do this or else. And so for some people that can look like I have to turn around five times and touch my nose before I um, do public speaking or um, before I leave the house or I have to, um, you know, so it can, it can feel somewhat superstitious because often these parts, when it, when it's like that, when it's superstitious in a sense, it's likely something that started very young. Uh, and it is a very young part that holds some superstitious or sometimes irrational thinking. And when we know that we can turn toward it and love it and be kind and tender toward it and update it. Right. Um, and sometimes it's, again, it's responding to the anxiety of another part. Sometimes it's the same part. Sometimes it's another part. You can always just go in and ask um, and see. And if you have a part that's obsessively doing something and it says, I'm afraid this would happen, you can ask, can I go to the part who holds anxiety around that? Or is there a part stuck in that moment that I can witness and reparent, redo, retrieve and unburden? So the parts will will always point you to what needs help at the root. Likely also when there's an OCD diagnosis, when there's a cluster of parts who are obsessive and compulsive, there's a part who wants to fix the OCD, um, desperately wishes it didn't exist, right? This is what's helpful with understanding that our systems are multiple, that they're there's often this push-pull and this feeling of, I don't have any control. This part makes me do this. I don't have a choice around it. And so there's another part that hates it. it says, oh, why? And so often the, the, the thing that we'll say is, oh, I hate that I do this. Why do I do this? And so there's kind of a frustration. It can even be a cluster of parts, an inner critic, and a part that seeks to find ways to fix it or suppress uh, usually the, the obsessive and compulsive parts. There can also be a hopeless part that really fears that will, there will be no end to the OCD because when um, these behaviors happen, and it can even be, honestly, things involved with, with eating disorders, bulimia, um, it's, something that these parts feel like they have control over and they're very, very compulsive, right? And it can feel to the rest of the system like it's taking over. And no matter what you try, whatever managers come up to shame that part, to punish it, to push it down, it just never works, right? So there are parts who feel hopeless around it. And we can offer them hope and say, there's nothing wrong with you. It's what happened to you. And if you will let me go or let, let your own self or let, if you're working with a client, the client's self go to these parts who are producing this and the parts who judge them and criticize them, hate them, fear them, will give space. You can go toward the parts who produce the obsession and the compulsion with curiosity and really find out what they're protecting, what is the root. And once the root is healed, they will naturally be able to stop um, 
their obsession and compulsion. Uh, there can also be a part who wants to ignore the other parts as if OCD did not exist. It's kind of like the, um, it's almost exiling <laughs> the OCD parts, but just like they say, what, what you resist persists. Those parts are just going to keep on trying to push up harder and harder. So even though this part who's trying to get rid of the OCD by ignoring it means well, um, it's likely discouraged because it's not effective. So again, at the root, there is at least one exile that is stuck in a moment of trauma. Um, and they're being protected by the parts who are hypervigilant or perform a compulsive behavior. So again, the obsession is often this hypervigilance around um, fix a fixation, right? Uh, and it has to do with a fear of never again, I'm never going to let this happen again. So you want to ask that part, what is it that you don't want to happen again? What happened? So we befriend those protective parts. Um, sometimes we have to go in layers, right? We have to befriend the parts who fear and hate and push down the OCD parts. We have to befriend them so that they will give us enough space to go to the obsessive and the compulsive parts. And then uh, we can offer to help the exiles or the ones stuck in trauma that they protect. Um, there's a there's other things written about this. I encourage you if you want to learn more, look up OCD from an IFS perspective. Um, there's a talk with Robert Fox on OCD type parts on the IFS Talks podcast from uh, looks like February twentieth, twenty twenty one. So it's a, a few years ago, but you might find that. Interesting. And I hope that by presenting this, what you can see is that it's not that scary. It's not that weird. It's not, it's not a some pathology, right? Um, it really does make sense. Every part of you makes sense. Even if it feels like it's coming out of the blue and it's taking you over, and why are you doing this? I guarantee you that there is a reason why it's doing that. And it could be even be a very young part based in trauma and things that happened pre-verbally. And these parts are very young and they have learned how to do this um, to help very young parts. And so once our adult loving self can go back and be with those young parts that felt terror, that felt um, alone, hopeless, helpless, out of control, and we can hold them and let them know they're not alone, then these obsessive compulsive parts don't, don't have to do this anymore. They can relax their roles. That's the hope we can offer them. They can either do something totally different in the system. Sometimes they want to do something opposite. Um, they want to just run and play in the dirt or, um, you know, give us happy thoughts or or something like that. Um, other times they want to just have a more moderate role, like my part who says, I want to remind you to check the locks, but I don't need to be too angsty about it, right? Um, but I have I had a part, if you watch my series on chronic pain, uh, often there can be, I had really obsessive parts that were fixated on the pain, constantly monitoring it. Where is it? How intense is it? Oh my gosh, it's there again. How are we going to fix it? It's a whole, it was a whole cluster of parts and they make sense, right? I had to go toward them and say, I get you, you're trying to help. You don't want me to be in pain anymore. Um, but what if I could go to the one who's causing the pain and I could help them with whatever they're protecting, the reason why they're causing the pain can we try that? Can you give me the space to do that? And once they did that, um, the, the new role that this part, this fixated fixing part wanted was uh, to be what she called the basker. She just wanted to be able to go out and bask in the, the sunlight, feel the breeze, look at the clouds, smell the flowers, uh, go to the park and go on the swing and just bask in the beauty of the present moment. 
So it's kind of very opposite of a fixation and a, um, a, a high level of stress. But again, she was not able to really fully relax until I, I myself gained her trust to allow me to go to the parts that she was fixated on. Um, so I hope that helps. Again, whatever your system is presenting, I invite you to get curious, go in and ask directly. And whatever blocks the way is the way, which means whatever parts come in the way of you being able to be fully open and curious, appreciate their intention, get to know those parts so that they trust you enough to relax. You don't have to think up any answers. You can just receive any question you have about why a part is obsessed about something, why it produces something compulsive, why it gives you these intrusive thoughts. Um, if you go in with total openness and you ask questions, you will receive answers. Um, so if you have been diagnosed with OCD, uh, or maybe you love someone who has, and you have a question about this, feel free to leave it in the comments, or maybe you have an experience with it that you want to share. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. So you can do that in the comments below.